Hello and welcome to Central Florida Salute YouTube. I'm your host and I have the honor of having another World War II veteran, United States Marine Corps, but we're here in Apopka. I gotta make sure I say it right because the crowd over there gets on me. Apopka, Apopka Florida at the VFW Post. And my guest is Mr. Lou, how do you say your last name, Lou? Boria. That's right. <laughs> Welcome to Salute, buddy. <laughs> so listen, uh, where are you from originally, Lou? I was born and raised in Brooklyn. New York. Brooklyn? Really? Yeah, my dad was uh, from Brooklyn. My folks are Puerto Rican. My mom and dad were born in Puerto Rico. My dad was in the Navy in World War I. Wow. And he made a couple of trips to Europe. And on the way back, on this last trip, the way back, he got pneumonia. So they put him in the hospital at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. The war ended, so he sent for my mom. They got married. So they became a, Here you are. a Brooklynite, Marine, a Puerto Rican. <laughs> They're called New Yorkans. Whatever you say, Lou. Yeah. yeah. So... Uh, you're World War II. When did, when did you go in? You obviously were from Brooklyn, so you were living in Brooklyn when you went in? Yeah. And uh, what, what, what year did you go in? Wait, what? What year did you go in? 1943. 43. How old were you? 16. Yeah, you're another one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah nobody signed for you, right? You signed yeah. yourself? No, no. Well, yeah. it, it, it's, a, it's a big story to it. See, I thought that I could be my mom didn't speak English so well. I think I'd get over. I took her to the recruiting station, told her to tell him I was 17, but she she knew. <laughs> so she told the guy how old I was, so they sent me home. So what I did was I, found a, I met a friend, and he tells me, why don't you go to the draft board? And told him you're 18. So I said, okay. So I went to the draft board, and he, next thing you know, I'm in the Marines. <laughs> but it's a big story, because when I, when I got called to, for induction, uh, you know, so you line up, and it, the guys come up, and they say, a Navy guy comes, he says, I need 10. So they go, okay, and they point, and they point them, tell me you're in the Navy. I said, no, I don't go, I ain't going to no Navy. He said, you go where we told you to go. I said, okay, what'd you say? But I'm not going into the Navy. Well, it goes back and forth, and next thing you know, they call the police, and the police are there, and I what the fuck is going on? I said, I didn't say they want to go to the service. I said, I am not going into the Navy. So I said like that, all of a sudden this PFC Marine walking by. He's mine. He's mine. So the next thing you know, I'm in Paris Island. Get off the bus and line up. And this is 1943. You know, with the complexions and everything else, all well, everybody's looking at me like, where did this guy come from, you know? Being so all white guys. So anyway, the sergeant walks up to me, he goes, Where are you from, boy? I said, Brooklyn, New York. Oh, no, wise guy, one of these wise ass from New York. Bah, bah, bah. He goes off. Then he's looking, he says, the pronunciation, you know, they, he said, you're a draftee? You could to my F, Marine Corps? A draftee? You couldn't volunteer? I mean, the guy's poking me in the chest. Of, he, he, I said, how am I going to tell him? I can't tell him. I'm 16. They throw me out. Yeah. I took all that abuse. I mean, from that day on, every day there was a draftee. You're a draftee. You couldn't volunteer. So <laughs> it was tough, tough times. You know, uh, but then, well, go ahead. I, I'll, your I'll, generation had a lot of you guys like you were yeah. 14, 15, 16, 17. And there's an association called the Underage Military Veterans. Yeah. And my friends, one of my friends started that. Yeah, really? And the youngest one I heard about was a girl. She was 12 years old. Oh. Yeah. And Eisenhower met her at one of the, the revelries, I think, and said, little girl, go home. Come back when I, you're old enough. Yeah. Of course, she never did, but. Yeah. That's a true story. Yeah. But anyway, so now you're 16 years old. Were you even shaving back then, or did you make believe you were shaving? Make believe. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah, yeah. They used to soap up and then finish. It was it was fun. It was really fun. It was uh, I think one of the uh, the biggest thing for me at the time during to, to Paris and getting you know the barracks was uh, going to the bathroom. 
I don't know if you know, they had a big, beautiful barracks, and in the bathrooms, are four toilet bowls in the front and four toilet bowls over here, and you face each other. So it took me about almost a week before I was able to go, you know, sit down in the bowl. So we're getting up in the middle of the night, you know, try over, and you'd always meet one or two guys, but uh, it, it was really, uh, you know, nobody thinks about it. Is, and I, you know, when I, was, I went in the Air Force too, it was the same thing. We were old barracks, so there were six of them this way, you know, and it's just, just like you and me are sitting here. How you doing? You know? It took some getting used to, didn't it? Oh, it sure did, especially showers. Don't drop the soap. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you never know when you come up with it. <laughs> okay, we're moving on, Lou. So you uh, you went to basic, Paris Island. Yeah. And uh, after that, where'd you go? Camp Lejeune. Camp Lejeune. Yeah, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, for infantry training. And uh, I think it's two or three weeks of training. By that time, I think it was sometime in May. I went in, uh, I think it was October, yeah, I think it was October 1943. And uh, anyway, when you finish boot camp, you go to Camp Lejeune, Camp Lejeune, you, then you get 10 day leave. <clears throat> so it was sometime in May, by the time I got. Yeah. yeah. So you got your 10 day leave, and then where did you go? Yeah, back to, back to Camp Lejeune, and then uh, we shipped out from Norfolk. They took us down to Norfolk, went aboard ship, went through the Panama Canal to Hawaii. We got to a transit station in Hawaii. I was with the 51st replacement draft. <laughs> and I, I still as I said, you know, I, 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 that I had remembered, you know, back that far, you know, the 52nd replacement draft. And then from there, they, uh, they send you whatever they, needed replacements. So I wound up in Hilo, Hawaii for about uh, a couple of months. And that's Hilo was where all the guys that that went to Iwo Jima, they all trained at the base. We were camp, they call it Camp Tarawa. Tarawa. And all these guys trained there and then mostly all those guys, 80, 90 percent of them killed out of Iwo. Yeah, but then we trained there at, at, at the base in Tarawa, up in the, up in Hilo for about a couple of months. So you got you get shipped overseas. Well, that was it. When we went, like I said, we went from Norfolk through the Panama Canal to Hawaii, and then from Hawaii they sent me to Hilo, and we trained at Hilo, and then from there we went to the Philippines invasion, the Vete in the Philippines. Oh, okay. it was fifty-three consecutive days on a troop ship. Fifty-three consecutive days. I mean. Horror. It's just plain horror being aboard a ship like that for, for such a long time with so many guys. There was no onboard movie or anything like that? Or? They had no movies. Not in those days. No, I know. I'm just kidding with you. But it, it was, like I say, it was just play, play cards, poker, whatever you could do all day, and stand on a chow line. You spend more time on a chow line than anything else, you know, for breakfast. And then, then at lunch, you didn't get, they gave you a, a, a how do you call it? peanut butter or jelly sandwich. And uh, then again, two days, uh, you got, I uh, think, twice a week you would get, uh, you know, fresh water showers. The rest of the time was salt water. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been on a troop ship, but uh, where you're packed one on top of the other. Yeah. And remember, in those days, they didn't have air conditioning. So they had the, these big funnels on, on board the ships. And if you faced into the, you know, you would get some air down below deck, but if not, man, you melt down there. Yeah. Stink like hell, yeah. yeah. All that sweat. And you had bunks, you know, f five high. If you get in the, in the bottom, the canvas is resting on your nose. <laughs> so after you get up for a while, you get, you know, heard talk to another guy, you know, you get on board, make sure they think a top bunk. So then after a while, you find out the guys get seasick. They lean over and they're puking all over it and it's splattered on it. Oh man, you talk about stench. Ooh. So you were ready to get off the ship. Oh, uh, so we you sure were. Ship and now you're in the Philippines, right? We, we landed, I think it was October, sometime, I think it was the 17th of October, 1944. 
I think it was 43, yeah, 44. Yeah. A lot going on there then, or what? We, 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 we landed to MacArthur. MacArthur was it? Yeah, General yeah. MacArthur. Yeah. So yeah. Anyway, in fact, the story was that MacArthur didn't want Marines. He wanted that to be all Army show, you know. Oh, really? To return, he returned back to the Philippines. So, <clears throat> and the only reason I know the story, because it came out in the, uh, the, the Stars and Stripes magazines, yeah. you know, newspaper, for that. and the story was that <clears throat> MacArthur had ordered us, you know, the Marine jackets, the you know, dungarees, has an emblem, USMC, yeah. and an emblem. MacArthur had us all cut it off. He didn't want nobody to know we're Marines. So he, could you imagine that, a big ass like that, that made us cut the, the emblem yeah, off I the... I can't imagine, I yeah. heard that. So anyway... So what did they, what, did they cut it off and did nothing there? Or, no, no, I'm saying what they cut just a pocket that, you know, it's just like a, a oh, signal. Oh, okay. Yeah. It says USMC and an emblem. So he says he would cut that off and anything on a truck's paint over anything that says USMC, paint over it. So anyway, when we got a show... Breaking news. I don't think anybody knew this. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what else was they saying? The frick a big... they like that. He, the, 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 what's the big thing about taking Marines, you know? So anyway, Nimitz... It, it, we had one of our officers, I don't know where the hell he found a, a 4x8, uh, you know, uh, uh, sheet of plywood. Yeah. And he put on a, on, a, on a plywood, with the grace of God and a few Marines, MacArthur returns to the Philippines, and he put it on the roadway. And they arrested, they wanted court martial MacArthur wanted him court martial And the Stars and Stripes got the whole story, and they, they made a big thing about it, because he, he had told he didn't want Marines. And Nimitz told him, you've got this far on the backs of the Marines, you're taking Marines. So that uh, that was a, a big, big story at the time. That's an interesting story. Yeah. Like I said, I never heard that. Yeah. In fact, my wife and I went to Quantico, Virginia. The, uh, the, they have a museum there. Yeah. <laughs> my nephew was with me, and I had gone to the bathroom, and the guy's asking my nephew, you know, about me. So he told him I had been in the Philippines, and blah, 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 this, this, and that. He said, when I came back, he said, come here, i got something to show you. The sign it was there. The, whole, the only thing they changed one word. We said, with the grace of God and a few Marines, they eliminated a few Marines. They said, the grace of God and the Marines. So that's but, at the uh, museum. Yes, it's at the museum. I'm going to call up a friend of mine. Yeah, it's in Quantico. Yeah, Quantico. Yeah, yeah. I got that's friends a, up there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's an interesting story. Yeah, that, that was, that was well, what a thrill that was to see that. You know what? I just is way back in the 20, 20, 20, Two or twenty, two thousand two or two thousand three. When, when I saw that at the uh, the museum, it was what a kick. That well, was really, that was it nice to see something like that. Uh, uh, how long were you in the Philippines? Was it like going on, or when well, you got I, there, or no? I, everybody, when you get into the, into the zone, the area, everybody goes below deck. Yeah. Okay, you stay down there, and all the time the, the you know, all the sh banging and sh shooting yeah. going on, it just drives you nuts. I mean, it's unbelievable the the, uh, the noise that it's. I mean, you got I don't know this fleet, hundreds of ships, and uh, you know the the destroyers are firing the you know the big and uh, dive bombers, and uh, so anyway, they, everybody goes down below deck, and you sit down there, and you're hearing all this gone. You know, then all of a sudden they say, you know, they can, oh, they can say, the boat landing, the so and so, man, your debarkation station. So you run up, get up on deck, and then, you know, you over the side. And you, you could, these nets. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think. And you're coming down on these nets. And don't forget, you got a pack on your back, a rifle, three or four bandoliers of ammunition, and you're trying to make it down. And now that boat don't sit still. Yeah. So that boat comes up, and, and you're coming down that net. All of a sudden, the boat drops, and now you're left dangling. And afraid that when the ship boat comes back, it slams in, don't pin you in there. So you, you got to try to time it so that when it gets up high enough, you let go and drop down. Now imagine with a helmet, all that. So when you slam down, I mean, you slam down. <laughs> so it, it's kind of tough. I, I think <clears throat> I had a couple of times I had to drive myself and go up, help a couple of guys come down. Because, I mean, they could freeze, you know, they, yeah. the idea of that boat, you know, bobbing up and down. And so you get in the boat and now you head out into what they call a rendezvous area. 
Mm-hmm. So there might be five or six other ships like that in your landing time. And you just get one right behind the other till the, all of them arrive. If they have any trouble on the beach, they hold you. I mean, I don't know how, but you can talk about seasick. If there's 30 or 40 guys on board, I, you can rest assured 25 are throwing up all over the place. And I mean, it's how Then you get, because these are all flat, so the boat is just coming, it, the wash comes over the top, you're soaking wet, and then smelling the fumes, just, you might be for an hour circling. But anyway, <laughs> by the time you're heading, I mean, everybody's laid out and puke all over the man. It's, it's sick. I mean, you talk about sickening, that's sickening. <laughs> so anyway, it, now when you get in, the closer you get to the beach, you got to get these guys up and up, you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> finally get a kick in them, but get, get up, get your bones up and then this and that. So anyway, get, you get ready to get, we come ashore. And you know, you, all this, you're a kid, you're thinking of nothing but women and kids. I mean, they charged us, hanging off our neck. Oh, I had about two poor kids, I, the ladies giving drinks and kissing you and hugging you. Americano, Americano, Americano. I mean, squeezing you to death. And the beach guy's out, get off the beach, get off. How do you get off the beach? You got two kids hanging over my neck, you know. But anyway, we, 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 it was the best landing ever, ever. I don't think it was, you know, the Filipinos were so great. Like, you know, they had been prisoners for almost seven years, five or six years, something mm-hmm. like that. So, I mean, they were so happy. They wouldn't turn us loose. And uh, so we finally got off the beach and moved up. So, but it, 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 that, it was like the rain, so it mean rain. I mean, you're in mud for about almost a foot. So uh, you imagine trying to walk in that with all the pack. Yeah, every right. time your foot goes down, you get sucked in. Now you got to put your foot out, and who knows for how long you're doing this, and that sun beating down. And one of the other things that people never know about is that you're soaking wet, right? The boat comes in to, to, to land. Watch you to put on the table. <laughs> Coming in to land. And with that boat, it, it, the coxswain, he knows that if he's coming in, then this guy's going to fly over the top of it. <laughs> so he, he slows the boat down. Yeah. So that when you get down, the boat drops. They open up. You might be up to your waistline in, in water as you come off. So, and then with the, the engines turning, so they're bringing up all that sand. So all this gets into your crotch and your backside and under your armpits. So then I get on the beach and you got to walk. And you got this pack on your back and the mud on your feet. And all the this, sand in your pants. And the sand starts rubbing. Yeah. So you imagine what it was like within an hour or so. Oh, your yeah. backside and your behind. Oh, yeah. Your armpits is just a roar as it could be. Yeah. I mean, you talk about pain. And there's nobody, there's no, give me a little bit of soap. Cold cream or something, nothing. So that it's 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 kind of tough. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> you want me to continue from there, right? Yeah. yeah well, I'm it, here. We 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 settled in, and it was kind of quiet. The the, 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 the Filipino guerrillas have done a great job. I mean, they were. I mean, we we made that the, the Filipino guerrillas were the ones that cleared all that that area. But we landed at. You know, I heard a story once, and I don't know where I heard it, but. The, the, the Filipinos, uh, the, the guerrillas like you were talking about, they wanted to help out getting rid of the Japanese. And they said, no, we don't want you. And they said, so to prove a point, they snuck in where the Japanese were sleeping and killed every other Japanese soldier. Yeah. Well, that might have been the story. Of, uh, where we were at, these guys were there. They cleaned that beach up and when we landed. They had everything secured so that we didn't, I didn't see a job until a couple of days later, but they cleaned the beach. Mm. The only thing about it was we had these guys with us, you know, the Filipinos, the, the guerrillas, they were like drinking with us and kidding and hooking and whatever was going on for a couple of days. The rollers saw one day, they're all gone. So we would say, where did the Filipinos go? You know, Finally, one of the two struggled back. And we, what the heck are you guys? Where do you go? Oh, we've got to go home and take care of the wife, you know. And, 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 and what about us? 
<laughs> but it was fun. So anyway, the next morning, they, they, they tell me, get, get, get in the jeep and they go back down to the beach, you got to get some chow and ammo and stuff like that. So anyway, get down to the beach and this beast master comes over, he's usually a major or so in the army, so he said, I, he said, I need you two guys. I said, no, 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 we, we got to get ammo. What outfit are you doing? I gave him the name of the outfit. I'll take care of it. Come on. So I said, what the hell is this guy? So they put us on the landing craft and send us out. One of the big uh, battle wagons had got a hit by a kamikaze. And, and you know, in those, in those, those ships, all the decks were wood, wood decks. Yeah, right. So the kamikaze went through and down into, and I mean, killed, I don't know how many guys down below. So we, we they said they, the ship can't go back out to see the buried, the dead. So it's been a couple of days already, and you know, they start to, so anyway, they had all these 17 stretches on, on the deck. Man, what a sight that was for a 17 year old. Yeah. They got, just like bundles with the black gauze, just pieces of bodies, and I mean, blood soaked through. So when you lifted them, and the wood deck, all that blood is, I mean, so you imagine doing this, Picking his carrying it, then bring it down below, put it in the small book, get back up and get it. So we got all, now we got 17 guys in, and you're stepping around and head for the beach. And when we got to the beach, the guy had people there to take them off. So he told us, we'll get, you know, to, to get, to get yeah. back to our office. Well, you know, that's, well, that's, that's the ugly part of war. Really. That, 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 was, but, uh, that was tough. So you, you said it was a few days before you even saw a Japanese. Yeah. And as you moved inland, yeah. is, that, is that what happened? Yeah. Well, what happens is, <clears throat> I, I was I was what they call a shotgun. You know, they, they, they get that name. But what you did with the artillery observer, you, you stay with him. You you his. You know what they call a bodyguard. Yeah. You carry you have to carry his equipment and make sure you stay always keep him in front of you, yeah. so that any kind of a attack or whatever's going on. You make sure that this guy pulls back and you stay up in front of him. You know, you protect him. So that that's what I was uh, doing. I, was, I think I was in, in the Philippines maybe seven or eight days like when I got wounded. That uh, we, he, he called in the targets and we, all of a sudden we were in a water barrage. I mean, I, I don't know if you, you talk to other guys and give you an idea. I can't, just can't describe it. It's just so horrible. Just to be in, in a... In a foxhole and these things are blasting all around you and, and every time though the blood you know you're in the country is nothing but sand so everything you get every time a bomb goes off the sand goes and it's just, you know you can feel coming down your neck over the top of it and you just lay there and just pray that just <laughs> that one doesn't hit your foxhole yeah because it's like chop suey you know and they try to identify that just maybe you might be able to find a dog tag but I mean, just pieces of body, and it's just so you you uh, you got wounded there. Yeah, it was a concussion. Just and uh, so anyway, we got we started to get. I found a guy. My my we got together with him, and uh, I, I said I I, I I just so clumsy and wobbly I, I, from the the concussion. He says, well, I I, I felt a little bit, but I, I said maybe you. Because the, the shell that landed closer to us, to us, and it was really, really tough. So anyway, so when I got, we, they, they pulled us back, back to get back to the outfit. Was a, one of the guys comes over and says, "Hey, you got blood all over your neck." And said, so they, the corpsman came over and he said, well, "You got to send you back to the field." You know, it's internal, so you got it. Yeah. So I got, I got down your ear. Yeah, it blew out my eardrums. And they, when I got down there, they, they put a tag on me. The next thing you know, I was on board a, an LST. They took me out to the hospital ship. So I, I think it was the Repose was the name of it. I don't, I'm not sure, but I, I think it was the name of the ship was the Repose. And they, they took us, they took me to uh, New Caledonia, one of the islands. And had a it's New Caledonia was a navy uh, French 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 uh, territory, and they, they had you no know, French guards. And anyway, they put me put us in a, put me in a naval hospital there, and uh, I stayed there for a couple of months. And then from there they sent me to Hawaii back to Hawaii. no they sent me back to Guam. I was on Guam for for about a month or two, and then uh, 
You know, was this still fighting going on in Guam then? Uh, Were you no, involved? With Guam, that? they had just invaded Guam. The, the Americans had, the Marines had taken Guam back. And uh, so they put us, they, to replace me. So I, I wound up at Hong Guam for about a, a month or so. And one day, <laughs> the, 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 the hospital, the, the, the doctor from the, the, the you know, the, that's what they, what they call it, the, the Coleman, you know, the metal, yeah. And uh, this Coleman tells me, you know, that they had sent me back. So he said, no, 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 not that guy, no. So he said for me, take it. He, he, he put a tag, he said, you can't go back into combat. You got all your eardrums. You're finished. You got, you got to go back. So they, they put me on ship and they sent me to Hawaii. I was in Hawaii for about, well, I guess, a month or two. And they sent me to Camp Lejeune, the hospital there. And the war ended. <laughs> well, when did the war end? They were afraid of you coming back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so was, the war ended and you got out, right? Yeah. So I, I, I got back. I says, the guy says, you know, you, you have enough points to go home. Yeah. If you want to stay, we'll give, we're going to give you a medical discharge. So that might take another month or two. You want to get out? You got the points? I take the points and I went out. Yeah. So I, I, I got out. <clears throat> And uh, little did I know, <laughs> the Korea started, and they called me back. Oh, they went back to Korea. September, the, I got called back August the 6th. I, but you know, just, I want you to think about this. August 6th, and landed in Incheon September the 16th. Figure that out. How could it, where's the training, where's it? Oh, you're walking? Uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just saying this. It's a long time, yeah. I mean, there's no time. I, and the point that was the, the bad part about it, that all these guys that got called back mm -hmm. and it, get into it, and then they put you, I, I wound up with the with the 7th Marines, 1st Marine Division. I wound up with the 7th Marines. 80% <clears throat> of these guys have never been in combat. Mm. I mean, this is back now in 1950. All the World War II guys were all gone out. So I was one of the, you know, that got called back. So there were about four or five other guys that got yeah. called back and wound up in the South, in the airline company, 7th Marines. We had guys on, on, on the deck of the ship showing how to load and, and fire right. They didn't even know how to fire. All these were reserve guys. Yeah. They used to go to the river once a week. Yeah. And it, so they never fired a rifle or anything. It was it was tough. I mean, to be with guys like that, you know. Uh, uh, so you were in Korea. How long were you in Korea? I, I might have been in Korea maybe ten, twelve days. Oh yeah. <laughs> I got wounded again. We were. You got wounded again? Yeah. They they put us on. I was on the Macarthur. That bastard again. <laughs> but that guy Macarthur had a. One had told Sigmund Rhee, you know, who was the president of the uh, South Korea, and he told him, I'm going to get Seoul back. So they ordered to put us on a 72, 72 hours, you know, to take Seoul. Yeah. So we're on the dirt for 72 hours, I mean, just kept going. And we got Seoul, and outside we just got to, I got to a town named Weijambo. And uh, so the word came for us to relieve it and to head back. So we jumped into the trucks and they're driving us back. All of a sudden, the mortars are dropping all around. And so we dove off the trucks into the ditch. And uh, all of a sudden, this tank is coming down to us. We see one of our tanks. So I ran out and I grabbed the, the telephone and I told him, tank, 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 this is infantry. It's about 10 o'clock, about 10 o'clock. So he says, I got you. So I let go of the phone. I turned around and started to head back to the... All of a sudden, they fired. I mean, you talk about gotten knocked down the ass off of the... I just rolled on the road. I just laid there. I mean, I was... My head was spinning. So the guys, were in the, they ran out and grabbed me, pulled me by the feet and into the ditch. And that's the next thing you know. I'm back in a, a hospital. They, they sent me to a Yokosuka, Japan hospital. You know, I stayed there a couple of months. I got back to a, a casual company. 
uh, I think it was, they call it, I think it was Camp Atsu, Japan. And it was a, uh, uh, nice old wounded guys in there. Yeah. So then, uh, from there, they they send you back to your office. So they came down, I was like this Thanksgiving dinner, 1950. And uh, right after we had that the dinner, they called us outside for a formation. He said, the commandant of the Marine Corps says that any Marine with two Purple Hearts is not to be sent back into combat. So he says, if any of you guys out there, report to the first second, Sergeant's office. So myself and a guy named Danny Sullivan, two of us, he was from Brooklyn too. And uh, we wound up and uh, they put us on board a ship and sent us back there to, to uh, Treasure Island. We got December the 15th, got back to Treasure Island. They had a big parade and all kinds of patriotic, you know, BS. And uh, so, so the commanding officer said, I'm going to get you guys home for Christmas. Christmas Eve, I walked through the church in Brooklyn. I couldn't believe it. My mom flipped out. She had to be Yeah, scene. yeah. So we got Christmas Eve. So I, I, so I got out of it. I didn't get caught up in a trap with the Chosen. Well, that was horrible. Yeah, my the outfit I was with, they were overrun. Yeah. I don't know how many. I did a lot of, lot of Korean veterans. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, my uncle was there at the Frozen Chosen. And, uh, that, that was tough to teach, especially for these guys, reservists. Yeah. I mean, to be, I mean, just the word Chosen, but just think about being... 20 below zero. Yeah, I was going to say frostbite was a big part of it. You can't, he, my you uncle can't change the frozen to, to be able to keep anything out of sticking in your mouth or, or put it underneath your armpits. I mean, it was horrible, horrible, really. I mean, they, and it was, well, I, I think they said something like it was 125, 130,000 chicks. And they had one, they had the, the first Marine Division in the trap, except one regiment was, I think it was, was it first, second, no, first, fifth, and seventh? I think, yeah, the, the, the fifth regiment was in reserve when, when, the chank, when the chicks came in, and they really put them up there. The guys that, that saved our boats with the English Marines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't remember that guy's name. I don't know where, I know he was a lieutenant colonel. I think his last name was Klein. But, he, but his office got beat pretty bad, so they integrated his, whatever the troops he had left with, with us, part of our, the 7th Marines. And uh, he said, you Yanks, this, you everything. It was, it was funny. You, you hear did, you, did you ever hear of a guy named Eddie Ko? Who? Eddie Ko. He was, he was basically, he was, a, he was a Korean kid. He became a, a spy who would help out the Americans. And later on, he came back. I heard of a guy named Shu. No, this they, is they, they brought it back. He was like that. They, in fact, they was in North Carolina. And the guys helped him. He set up a restaurant and was making big, yeah. big bucks. This is Eddie Cove. I did, a, I did a show with Eddie. Mm -hmm. Eddie's with the Lord now. That was funny that this guy's name was Shu. You know, yeah. S H U. You know, like so they always had good shoes. They thought he was. Yeah. But, but anyway, anyway I, I, I've done a lot with the Korean veterans over over the years, and uh, actually, I'm an honorary member of Chapter 169 in the villages, and um, I had a lot of good friends who were. Korean uh, yeah. veterans. You know this but, thing. Uh, when you let me ask you, when you got out of the service, w w what did you do? You know what I. Uh, you must have had a job. Uh, no, no. I uh, believe me. When I come out, I was sergeant and everything. And I thought I was going to be able to stay, but they sent me to Quantico, Virginia, and I was in Quantico. Uh, we were teaching the uh, Korean officers. You know, oh, okay. So they call it school groups. And you pick up a class of 12 for, for 12 weeks. You stay with them 12 weeks and do all these different amphibious landings, you know, all kinds of tactics. So we went on a night problem. So we were to attack the, the Korean Marines. They, they were going, and it was something like 2 o'clock in the morning. So we piled the rubber boats in put the boats down <laughs> and started heading in and we're running up all of a sudden I hear wham guy hits me across and say you're my prisoner you're my prisoner this Korean is on top of me I said you're prisoner 
I mean, I had to tell you what I said. But I got wham! I ran my rifle into his chest, and I took off. I said, "That bastard! I know he ain't gonna move for about a day." <laughs> so, but you know what? Just thinking about it, I said, "You get back. Imagine you're a veteran of World War II and Korea, and then some freaking ja Korean it, it takes you prisoner. You know how they they yeah. shame you guys? Oh, these guys will be kidding you. You don't, you don't do that to us. No, no. The, the guys will be kidding you for the rest of your time. So there. How long did you train over there with these people? Uh, just in Quantico? Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I told you, it's nine weeks. Nine weeks. Yeah. So then, but then after, right after this happened, you know. I don't know if you heard, but anyway, when you go in this thing, they sit, they call, you know, they have empires, they're watching it, what's going on. And these empires, they, they have nine inch firecrackers, and they throw them to, like, they're simulating grenades or yeah, yeah, water yeah. fire. Yeah. Would you believe he throws it? It bounced off my helmet. <sighs> so, what do you think I wound up back in the hospital again? So, they. they the doctors, they tell me, Sergeant, your time is up. You can't, you can't, you can't. He yeah. said, this, no, you have something like this. He said, it could kill you. He said, something, you don't have an eardrum, and you rip any part of your brain, and you cripple, blind, or whatever. You got to get out. So they, they, I had to get out. And like I said, 14 years. 14 years in the Corps? Yeah. And oh, then, this first sergeant from the company, he told me, he called for me. He says, you want to stay in the Corps? I said, yeah, of course. I like to say, I don't want to get out. I don't even have a high school diploma. What the hell am I going to do outside? Unless this guy, what was that guy? <laughs> they had that gangs in New York. I said, unless he hired me. I said, I one, of the, one, of, one of the dudes and, uh, with the mafia. So anyway, so he told me, he got, got, so he sent me to a, the fire department on the base. You know, stay with and the fire department. That was there one day. <laughs> they, they pulled the truck out, wash it, put it back in. This is it. No ranks, no way, nothing. And he said, I said, I went back. I thought, no, 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 no. I get out. I, I, so I, I did. I got out. I, I went to school. By this time, I got three kids, three boys. And uh, you had your kids follow you to service? Did any of your boys follow you into the service? No, none of them. I, got a, I was going to get to that story. I got a, a chief was trying to find a picture. When I got called back, I made the front page of the Daily Mirror in New York. Yes, the next day, it showed me saying goodbye to I got my son, the, 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 the three years old. I was hugging him. Front page of the Daily Mirror. <laughs> so six months, Steve, she forgot. She meant to bring the picture. He forgot it. But anyway, I'm, he gets killed and I in Korea, I mean in Vietnam, my boy. Look, I just, I'm hugging, he got killed in Vietnam. And then I lost my other son, uh, uh, I think it was no, October last year. He got the Agent Orange, he just rotted away. So, he, in fact, he was born the same day we made the, the landing in, in Incheon, September the 16th. He was born September the 16th, and, but he, he, he died with the Agent Orange. They did so many operations and he had a, a cancer of the stomach. He, he, well, so let me ask, how old are you now? How old? Yeah. Next two weeks from now, I'll be 95. <laughs> Looking good, my friend. Yeah, You're doing yeah. good. But I think we're about out of time. Yeah. You know. Uh, but, but anyway, we get back. I got back, I, I, you know, I said, what the hell am I going to do? I started to work for, for Squibs Pharmaceutical. Yeah. The, the, the guy, one of the friends said, hey, they're hiring, the big, they got this uh, penicillin, and they're hiring like crazy down here. So I go down there, fill out the application, so the lady says, you know, only jobs we got open right now are porters. So, you know, whatever jobs open up, Guys in the plant got put in bid for them, and they get them. So yeah. well, we, you know, we hire from the bottom, and you work your way up in, once you're in. So I thought, well, I said I'm working with this plumbing outfit. He said I, I got to work six days a week, and I get one hundred and fifty dollars. He says this job is five days a week, and I get one hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> I'll take the job. So she told me no. She said. I, I can't do that. 
And I went eventually to walls and then and I can't, I can't, my conscience, she says, she said, you go home. If you feel the same way tomorrow morning, you'll be here. So the next day I was there. I took the job. They started to work six days a week. So I got time and a half on Saturday. So I was bringing home close to $200 a week. So anyway, I kept that, stay there with them for about six, seven years. So I, from Porter, which was a level one, I went to level 13 in, in a couple of years' time. So I was making big bucks. Yeah, good for you. All of a sudden, the company decides they're going to move to the factory. So now I'm out of a job. So during the, time, the period, we had about four or five veterans, you know, and uh, so in the city of New York, you go to the Civil Service Commission and you mm -hmm. pay $25 and you get applications for the police, fire, sanitation, and transit. So I filled out all the applications. Would you believe they told me, you know, for figures, they say, uh, August of the coming year, we're going to be laid, you're going to be laid off. So I think it was in June, they told me. In, in, in uh, August, you know, You'll, you'll be getting laid off. So said, you're going to get five weeks pay and, and everything else. So anyway, in the meantime, I had all of these old applications and I get a call from the transit authority. So the last week I was on a job, I was going to school for the transit authority to become on the trains in the city. So I got, became a, a conductor on the train. So I, I, I think that I, I had taken the, the test for the Department of Sanitation. So all of a sudden, they called me from sanitation department. So I got down. He said, I said, well, I, I'm working with the transit. I said, you know, sanitation is six days. Transit, I used to have to get up at five in the morning, four in the morning, travel to the Bronx, get on the train, make two trips, get off the train, come home, call back, go back again at 10 o'clock at night, make one. It was. Yeah, but sanitation, you went five hours or six hours a day, and you went to the same place, and you reported you worked. You pick up garbage. But uh, to tell you the way, what, the, how, what the, it's the paramilitary sanitation department, just like the police and firemen, they're paramilitary. You wear uniforms and everything else. So, and they have ranks, but all inside, nobody from outside could, you know, take the test for an officer. You got to be on the job, you know. So if you pick up garbage, you can apply for the test to take it, become an officer. So anyway, I think I worked for three years picking up garbage. They say, "What? Why, why did you take that job? Why don't you stay with the transit?" Let me tell you something: paramilitary rank in Kilmer, and five weeks vacation a year from day one. So in other words, you didn't have to put twenty years in to get five days vacation. Yeah, yeah, right. Five weeks vacation. So I, I mean, I was. So I took the job. Would you believe? Three days, three years later, I took the test. I became a lieutenant. Hello, uh, no, Mar Marine, Marine green uniform. Now you tell me, if I'm in, a, I know how to wear a uniform. Every place I went, what the heck? What are you? Do? This is you're a garbage man. Get the hell out of here! And then Department of Sanitation. That's what I'm enough. Would you believe? Two years later, a captain. So I retired as captain, and the Marine Corps, I never would have made it. Hey, Captain, we got to go. <laughs> we we got we to gotta wrap this up. we got another gentleman we're going to interview, I believe. But you've got one terrific story, my yeah. friend. And I thank, thank you for everything you did, Two Purple Hearts. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. I, I, one of the greatest, you know, my, I was married for 63 years. My wife passed away with Alzheimer's. That lady sitting over there. We know each other for over 20-something years, the same members at the church. In fact, she came to my 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah? yeah so that she used to come and help take my wife when she got Do sick. Do you have a card like Jack? No. I got a wife. I don't need Jack's a card. Jack's got one, too. I don't need a card. She takes care of everything. He's happily married. I was wondering if you got a card that said you were happily married. Yeah. I, we got to go, brother. I'm telling uh, you. Have a nice trip. Yeah. yeah. I want to thank you for, for coming on the show. My pleasure. It was you know, fun. It, it was, yeah. yeah you, so. you have got one terrific story. I've yeah. got a feeling we could go for hours, but we have time limitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you've got a cover on. That's the camera there, and we're going to say goodbye. And this is how we do it. To all our veterans out there, our active military and our families, we salute you for all you do. Till next time.
Since 2009, Project SOS has assisted our veterans both overseas and here at home to overcome medical issues, homelessness, and disabilities. Initially, our efforts resulted in over 22 clinics opened in Iraq and Afghanistan. Recently, as troops have been withdrawn, we have concentrated on issues here at home. During this past year, we have been able to distribute 42 motorized wheelchairs and numerous mobility devices to our local veterans who have served in World War II and up to and including Afghanistan. We continue to offer solutions to our local homeless veterans in the Ocala National Forest and other Central Florida locations. Project SOS Support Our Soldiers needs your assistance to continue helping a growing homeless veterans population. Over-the-counter medications and personal hygiene supplies are acutely needed. Your financial aid will greatly increase the support they so desperately need.